And then if you do your operation as you basically do one of these and then do the other, so maybe rotate it, then flip it, and see that you're in the same place you would have been if you'd done this other flip or something. So, um, so here are some Pascal walk uh, triangles generated with, we put a reflection down one side and a rotation down the other side. And generally that will generate, if you, if you start the smallest reflex, or smallest rotation and a reflection, you'll generally get the whole group. Um, so DN is a symmetry group of a regular n-gon, so we don't have to stick to just a square. We can take a regular n-gon. It has order 2n, okay? The order of a group is the number of elements in the group, okay? So you generally have n rotations and n reflections. Um, and uh, so for the square, you have the reflections across the these axes and the cross axes, right? So there are four reflections and then four rotations. The 360 or zero is one of those rota rotations and that is your identity element, okay? Um, so these triangles, like I say, are generated by one rotation, one reflection. So go ahead. And here are some things. Uh, you can pull out subgroups and you can see different <coughs> patterns. I'm going to start going a little faster because I don't want to keep you past 6 o'clock. So uh, keep going. Um, there's some other pictures showing different things you can pull out. Um, another non-abelian example, this is S3, okay, which is also D3. All right. Notice that the pattern's not as nice. Um, and if you keep going, in fact, it's really kind of chaotic here. But an interesting thing is all six of these are pascal watt triangles with D3 or S3. Okay. The only difference is I've rotated what the colors are. They're different colors. But look at how different it is in what you see in the patterns. So the choice of colors really has a dramatic effect on what you can visualize on this. So that also raises interesting questions about perception. So go ahead. So here's D3 and Z2. So you were seeing those triangles, all right? Well, Z2 is a subgroup, a subgroup of D3. So you can see there, there are um, similarities in the patterns. And in fact, go ahead, if you um, just look at um, different, different elements in the group, okay, you basically, if you mod out by A3, you get Z, Z2. And you can do with the, this with quotient groups um, on the cyclic groups as well. And I'm sorry, if it, I'm, I'm not going to go into definitions of quo, quotient groups and stuff. You can look those up because, frankly, I probably couldn't do it. Um, remember. Mike was the one who reminded me this had to do with groups in the first place. Go ahead. Um, so we can use this to look at quotient groups. Are there other group properties we can visualize? Um, do you see qualitative differences, visual differences between, say, D3 and D4? Yeah, much crisper, chaotic, right? Go ahead. Can we predict this? Well, here's D8, and it looks more like D4, right? So you might say, well, maybe the odd ones are that chaotic stuff, and the even ones are nice. Um, whoops. Go to the next one. 
But here's D32, which looks, you know, it's, it's pretty densely packed there, but it still looks a lot like that D4. But look at D34. Okay. Well, it turns out there's something called a P group. All right, this is a lot like our previous patterns. Uh, Dn is a P group if and only if n is a power of 2. Okay, a P group is a group whose order is a prime power. All right, so if we have a P group, okay, and the size of the group is a power of 2, then every element has order 2 to a power for some power less than the m that okay um, what about other areas of mathematics do they ever come in well we notice when I had that slide with the different numbers of rows, if you zoom in or zoom out, uh, you see some self-similarity. So we played a little bit with uh, defining a fractal dimension for these. So um, that's one of the other things we've had students look at. Uh, so we've done Pascal's triangle. We had some serendipity. What about cellular atom automa automata? Sorry, go ahead. Um, a one-dimensional cellular automata is just a row of cells that take on some value from a finite alphabet. Okay, so our values could be the whatever, what do I have, five here? The five colors for Z5, all right? And then in addition to that, there has to be some kind of rule for updating those values. All right, so Pascal's triangle is actually, um, mod five is actually an example of a cellular automata. It's an infinite cellular automata in that you, ha you essentially have infinitely many cells, okay? We just start out by putting a one in the first cell and then doing the, and putting zeros everywhere else, and then we use our update rule. And so each row of Pascal's triangle, it's just that here we're not showing the infinite red on either side. Okay, so there's a, another way to see it, um, just without having this one sort of skewed off to the side. Okay, so this shows basically you have your row and your update rule is you add the two mod n, or you do your group multiplication of the two to get the next row. So, of course, we also might be interested in finite cellular automata. So if we just wrap our row of cells, we take a, a finite number of cells and we just define the neighbor of the last cell to be the first cell. And the I'm going to get my left and right back. My right-hand neighbor of the last cell to be the first cell, and my left-hand neighbor of the first cell to be the last cell, then you basically are wrapping it around a tube. And here is what happens if you run your cellular automata, finite cellular automata, for Z5. Notice that the values begin to repeat. There are only finitely many possibilities now. So eventually, something's going to have to repeat, right? Um, so eventually you get to a, a periodic cycle, okay? Once you start repeating, once you've gone to repeat that previous one, well, you're back up there and you're going to go back and repeat that. So we have the transient cycle, what it does before it gets to where it starts repeating, and then a cycle a periodic cycle. Now this one actually you can see has this triangle down here is the same as this triangle up here. So it doesn't have a transient. Everything's included in it. Okay? So this is um, 
the, let's see, it's 25 cycle, uh, cells. Five divides 25, that ends up being important. And um, it repeats every 100 rows. Okay, next. Of course, if you do it with 18 instead of uh, 25, the periodic cycle contains 2,232 states, and the initial state, the one with only one non-zero value, does not repeat. It's transient. So there are other questions we can say, can we predict in advance what the length of the cycle would be, uh, when you're going to have, a, when something's going to be transient, when it's, so those are all undergraduate research questions that we've posed. Another way to generalize this is to consider two-dimensional cellular automata. And if we can, and basically you, if you want a finite one, you take a, a grid and you wrap it around a torus. You know, identify the, the top, the neighbors of the top being the bottom cells, the neighbors of the left being the right cells again. Um, go ahead. And you have some kind of update rule which the value of this cell has to depend on the values of these nine cells. Um, so one that I used was just basically taking, updating this to be A, B, C, D. Okay? But you can do anything. And here are some nice pictures that, that we made. And we can look at all the same questions about um, Here's uh, period 62, 31 by 31 grid. And I programmed the, um, I made my program so that it would find these, these periods and figure this out. Okay, so we've covered the title, but there's a little bit more serendipity. Um, while I was working with uh, Mike on this, in 1999, in the summer of 1999, I was asked by the National Science Foundation to review for course curriculum and laboratory improvement grants. And at the end of our review cycle, we sat down and said, what did we see, what did we not see, et cetera. And pretty much everybody said, we didn't see many grants for improving upper division mathematics. I was in the math group. Um, so I went back to Mike and I said, Mike, we can get a grant <laughs> on this stuff. We can get some money to, to, set, to do this. And that summer, or June 2000, I guess, so that next year, um, we submitted the Pascal Waugh Pascal Project Visualizing Abstract Algebra, and it was funded. And go ahead. Um, we got, I, I like, does anybody know that the song, the cover? I want to get my picture on the cover of the Rolling Stone. Uh, it must be an American it. thing. Actually, I probably can't. But at any rate, it's, it's like, you know, the rock star, they want to get their picture on the cover of the Rolling Stone. You know, it's like, I felt like I got my picture on the cover of the Rolling Stone when I made this picture, and it's on the cover of the MAA Focus. Um, doesn't matter if it's a P group. I generated that picture. That was just, it's like my 15 minutes of fame. And I was invited to give a talk on this uh, based on that and all kinds of stuff. Um, we applied for a second grant with additional sub uh, grant subcontract sites. Um, we involved some of the field testers from our first grant formally, and uh, we did undergraduate research retreats at New College. So these are pictures taken at our undergraduate research retreats. And then we hired Dr. Don Spickler who's a much better programmer than I am, and he speaks Java, which is helpful because, you know, Visual Basic is no more. Um, my program still runs. It still runs on this computer, Windows 10. I know someday I will wake up and I will tr have a new, op or actually probably an update to this operating system, and then it will no longer work, and there will be nothing I can do about it. But um, Don writes in Java and uh, basically took over my role as, as and I was department chair by that time and had lots of other things. And so the project has almost grown outside of my control. <laughs> but 
Um, there are still people, I get emails from people all over the world asking questions about the Pascal Wah project. Um, we have a website, www.pascalwa.org. Um, and I invite you to go out there. You, you can download my program while it still works. It's out there. But you can also download uh, various um, smaller programs and uh, larger programs, Pascal Wa JE. Pascal, Pascal GT is mine, and Pascal Wa JE is Don's. But they all do similar things and play with the patterns and see if you find anything interesting in them. And there are my references that you can't possibly read in that small print that's a little blurry. Um, but I can send them to anybody if you. And web resources. Um, one of the, the most famous cellular automata is John Conway's Game of Life. Um, that's an infinite uh, rectangular grid one. And you, you can, if you just Google it, you can find uh, programs on the web and stuff. It's, it's uh, lots of fun to play with. Um, and all of this work was uh, done with support provided by the National Science Foundation. And we have to say any opinions and everything are mine and not the National Science Foundation, mm -hmm. the, all the small print. You know, the, the lawyers made us say that stuff. Um, and by the Richard A. Henson Endowment of Salisbury University. So there we go. And I would like to.